président de la Cour de, de justice européenne, permettez-moi euh, de rappeler pour ceux qui ne vous connaîtraient pas que vous avez été juge au tribunal de première instance de, de septembre 1989 à octobre 2003, puis juge à la Cour depuis octobre 2003 jusqu'en octobre 2012, puis vice-président de la Cour, et enfin vous êtes président de la Cour de justice de l'Union européenne depuis octobre 2015. Mais à l'origine, vous étiez plutôt un professeur. Et un avocat. Absolument. <rire> professeur de droit européen à l'Université de Leuven, puis au Collège de l'Europe à, à Bruges, à la Harvard School, et vous avez même été inscrit au barreau de Bruxelles. Oui. C'est pour ça qu'on vous a invité. <rire> Merci. C'est très, très bien. Vous connaissez le Conseil des barreaux européens, puisque dès 2014, vous êtes intervenu lors d'un colloque que nous avions organisé pour euh, évoquer l'avenir de la juridiction. Et je dois dire que le Conseil des barreaux européens entretient, par l'intermédiaire de son comité, euh, dont je veux saluer le travail, et son président, César Riza, et l'ensemble des experts, des liens constants et étroits avec la Cour et avec euh, Peter McNamee, bien sûr. Des réunions ont lieu à Luxembourg pour échanger. Et, et surtout, nous avons publié des guides euh, qui auparavant vous avaient été adressés et qui effectivement permettent d'aider les avocats. Notre souhait, c'est de faciliter l'intervention des avocats en donnant les indications pratiques qu'ils attendent. Mais au-delà de cela, nous sommes heureux de recevoir un juge européen. Certains gouvernements, certains hommes d'État ou qui aspirent à le devenir, ont maintenant trouvé un nouveau terrain d'action et de discours. Il s'agit de multiplier les critiques contre les juges européens. Il s'agit de considérer que ces juges européens n'ont pas à défendre les libertés, à défendre les droits, et au nom de nationalisme exacerbé, ils entendent refuser que les juges européens interviennent pour assurer à nos concitoyens les libertés et les droits fondamentaux. Nous entendons des hommes d'État parler de quitter la Cour européenne des droits de l'homme. Nous entendons des hommes d'État critiquer la jurisprudence de la Cour de justice sur tel ou tel point, et notamment, je pense, à la question des enfants, et cela est absolument scandaleux. Les juges, dans certains pays, sont critiqués, harcelés, menacés. Je me dois de parler de la Pologne. Le tribunal constitutionnel, le président du tribunal constitutionnel, fait l'objet de critiques. Il y a eu deux enquêtes judiciaires ouverte contre lui. Récemment, dans un quotidien, il a indiqué son angoisse concernant son avenir. Son mandat se termine en fin d'année et il a indiqué qu'il était inquiet car il se demandait s'il n'allait pas, dès la fin de son mandat, être arrêté. Tels sont les propos qu'il a tenus effectivement à des journalistes et qui sont quand même inquiétants. Dans d'autres pays, on menace de quitter effectivement la Cour européenne si elle ne modifie pas sa jurisprudence. Chaque pays veut maintenant définir son propre état de droit. Mais nous savons que dans état de droit, le mot le plus important, c'est droit. Et donc, nous savons que s'il y a droit, il doit y avoir la protection de l'indépendance des juridictions et des avocats qui plaident devant ces juridictions. L'état de droit se définit par la protection des juges, la protection des avocats, et aujourd'hui, trop souvent, et les juges et les avocats font l'objet de menaces, de chantage, de harcèlement, ce qui est inacceptable. C'est donc dans ce climat particulièrement délicat que nous vous recevons, et votre parole n'en est que plus précieuse. Merci, Monsieur le Président, de ces paroles 
tout à fait euh, importante par les temps que nous vivons. C'est un grand plaisir, cher confrère, je dirais, euh, d'être ici à Bruxelles. Je suis membre du barreau de Bruxelles, évidemment dans un statut omis, ça ne peut pas être autrement lorsqu'on est juge, hein, mais quand même omis du tableau, hein, et c'est toujours un plaisir d'être ici. Euh, il est vrai que dans mes fonctions actuelles, je voyage dans toute l'Europe. Hier, à ce même moment de l'après-midi, j'ai parlé à Bratislava, en Slovaquie, dans le cadre de la présidence slovaque du Conseil de l'Union européenne. Et ce sont les mêmes thèmes que vous avez abordés, celui de l'État de droit, qui est au centre euh, de, des préoccupations dans euh, plusieurs de nos États membres et aussi au niveau de l'Union en tant que telle, qui est en cause. Permettez-moi que je parle en anglais maintenant. Je crois que c'est plus accessible, peut-être, sans interprétation. But changing the language is not really changing the theme. Because, ladies and gentlemen, uh, beyond the great honor uh, you have done to me to invite me here today to take part in the 20, in the 126th, it's even difficult to say, plenary session of the Council of Bars and Law Societies of Europe. It is for me also an opportunity to share with you some thoughts on the role of the Court of Justice precisely in relation to this uh, defense of the rule of law. Throughout the past decade, it has become commonplace to suggest that we live in ever more complex and fast-changing times. That said, the European Union and its member states face serious challenges. There is a constant threat of terrorism. Europe has been through a serious banking crisis, and large-scale migration causes real political tensions within and among the member states. Each of those societal challenges has found its way into the docket of the Court of Justice of the European Union. Each in its way may be seen, moreover, to pose an existential threat to certain aspects of the European integration project. The purpose of my address tonight is to highlight the need for the Court of Justice when addressing such challenges to strike a delicate balance between not only competing interests, but also competing rights. Now, we'll first illustrate that observation by reference to the fight against terrorism. Recent events have tragically shown that the struggle against terrorism is one of the great challenges that we in Europe will continue to face for years to come. As we all know, one effective way of combating international terrorism is by starving it of financial resources. Another is by preventing individuals involved in terrorism be they EU citizens or third state nationals, from entering the territory of member states. In this regard, courts throughout the Union have been confronted with the problem of determining whether material which public authorities present to the courts, but which they do not wish to disclose to the individuals concerned, may be relied upon as evidence. And here, you have already understood, we are already at the heart of the profession of the avocat, lawyers, etc. Rechtsanwälte, I see the German flag, etc. At the EU level, the ruling of the Court of Justice in the ZZ case, decided in June 2013, is of particular I would even say crucial importance. 
Mr. ZZ is a French Algerian national who enjoyed a right of permanent residence in the United Kingdom. He left the United Kingdom to go to Algeria, one of his states of nationality, that is. Soon afterwards, after he had left the UK, the Secretary of State for the Home Office in the UK decided to cancel Mr. ZZ's right of residence and to exclude him from the United Kingdom on public security grounds, all of this in accordance with Article 27 of the EU Directive 2004-38. Why that directive? Simply because Mr. ZZ was next to being Algerian, also French, and hence a union citizen, exercising his right to free movement and freedom of residence in another member state and his own, namely the UK. Despite that decision, excluding his access to the national territory, Mr. ZZ traveled to the UK, where upon arrival, a decision refusing him admission on grounds of public security was issued. He was sent back, and actually went back, to Algeria. Mr. ZZ unsuccessfully challenged that decision before what is called the Special Immigration Appeals Commission. In short, the British lawyers present know, SIAC. SIAC delivered an open, between quotation marks, and a closed, again quotation marks, that's the real name, in other words, judgment. And the open judgment read as follows, and I'm reading it to you in its entirety. It's not that long, that's why I can read it in entirety. Quote, for reasons which are explained only in the closed judgment, the Secretary of State is right to refuse Mr. ZZ admission to the United Kingdom. Final stop. That's the open judgment. The closed judgment is closed. We have said that it is more than 15 pages long, but we don't know. Mr. ZZ was informed neither of the grounds on which the decision taken against him was based, nor of the evidence supporting those grounds. So Mr. ZZ, that is his lawyer, because he was, of course, in Algeria, brought the case, his case, on appeal before the Court of Appeal for England and Wales. And that court, which is a very high-level court, refer, it's higher than the High Court, eh? you go straight from SAIC to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal referred the question, preliminary reference, to the Court of Justice in order to know whether Mr. ZZ had to be informed on the grounds and evidence on which the decision of the Secretary of State for the Home Office was based. The Court of Appeal reasoned, in fact, Mr. ZZ is being deprived from a right, a substantive right, he enjoys on the basis of union law. That is, the right to reside in a member state, UK, other than his own, France. And Article 27 of the Citizens Directive provides for the possibility of refusing that right in extremely restrictive circumstances relating to public order and national security, but then Articles 31, 32 say that there must be effective remedies, and even without those articles, effective remedies are due under Article 47 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which clearly applies to of the EU, which clearly applies to such proceedings, because of course when member states implement the Directive on the Citizens' Rights, they are implementing union law within the meaning of Article 51, first paragraph of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, which is therefore applicable to such cases. The Court of Justice replied to the Court of Appeals for England and Wales 
that the person concerned, in this case Mr. ZZ, must be informed in any event of the essence of the grounds, those are the words, in any event, be informed of the essence of the grounds on which a decision refusing entry is based. The evidence, however, underlying those grounds may, where appropriate, remain confidential. The National Court is required to examine whether compliance with the rights of the defence requires the evidential value of confidential evidence to be limited. Why is the essence of the grounds always due? It's simply because the person concerned must know, must have a clue, you could say in untechnical language, of what it is, why he is being refused access to the territory, in spite of his right flowing from union law. However, disclosing evidence is a very delicate balance. Normally the evidence is due, of course, in contradictory proceedings. However, the evidence may reveal sources, which in turn may entail risks for life and limb of people who are at the origin of information. So sources may have to be protected, not just for the efficiency of further inquiries and investigations in the fight against terrorism, but also not to endanger people who might be at the origin of those uh, evidential, um, evidential information. But of course, when the evidence is adduced by the public authority, has not been seen and commented on by the other party, the court, our court said, the national court, when assessing such evidence, should take into account that the evidential value, that is the value as evidence, is weakened through the fact that it has not been contradicted by the other party. And it's only one sound that the court has heard. In any event, the national courts must have at their disposal and apply where necessary techniques and rules of procedural law which accommodate, on the one hand, the legitimate state security considerations regarding the nature and sources of the information taken into account in the adoption of the decision, and on the other hand, the need to ensure sufficient compliance with individual procedural rights, as the right to be heard and the adversarial principle. So in practice, this means that, first of all, all the evidence should be given to the court, and that's very important. We have had cases before the general court in such matters where the council said, this is too top secret. We can't even give it to the court. It's very simple. The council lost its case. So that has now been remedied. So the court must be trusted. Then the court must in principle give to the other party. That's the adversarial principle, the contradiction. It's the normal work of such type of procedure. If there are overwhelming reasons which militate in favor of, let's hope, a limited secrecy of some pieces of evidence, then the court should take into account that for those pieces of evidence there has not been the contradiction and that therefore the value as evidence should be very, very cautiously approached because it has not been the object of contradiction. The famous Cadi judgments also illustrate that the courts of the European Union are seriously committed to the protection of fundamental rights, including, that is, procedural fairness and equality of arms. Indeed, the reasoning in the ZZ case played a pivotal role in the Court of Justice's rationale in the Cadi 2 case, a case before the EU courts that concerned the validity of an EU regulation implementing a United Nations Security Council resolution that ordered the freezing of the assets of Mr. Cadi. Court of Justice held that the EU courts must exercise their review powers in full regarding disclosure of sensitive material 
it decided that the framework of analysis set out in ZZ applies by analogy to EU measures. And that's, you see, how our code works. You first get a national case of fight against terrorism. This Mr. ZZ was in fact suspected of having engaged in radicalized Islamic groups in Algeria linked to Al-Qaeda. That's sort of what was in the file. And they don't tell him anything and they say, now you're out. This is a citizen's rights case, but framed in the context of combating of terrorism. And we have made the balance of the competing interests and rights which I just described. Qadi is a different case. Qadi is an Iraqi and he has been put on a list of suspected terrorists whose assets should be frozen in the European Union. It has nothing to see with Union citizenship rights or residence rights or free movement, but it's a freezing order. All the member states of the European Union are, of course, members of the United Nations, and they're bound by the Security Council resolutions, which are binding acts for all the member states. But implementing the sanctions decided at UN Security Council level is, in fact, a competence of the European Union. That's perfectly possible that members of the United Nations um, sort of implement the obligations they have under the UN Charter in the framework of an integration structure among themselves, i.e. the European Union. But then the Union must be effective in taking the sanctions, otherwise its member states, the constitutional law developments in all our member states. We follow constitutional jurisprudence of the National Constitutional Courts, of the Supreme Courts, we read all of that. We see how they strike the balance so as not to reinvent the wheel at each occasion, whereas that wheel has already been very well oiled in the national constitutional traditions. So contrary to what is often thought, yes, we read as an ally the case law of the Bundesverfassungsgericht, of the European Court of Human Rights, of the UK Supreme Court, of the French Court, of the Estonian Court, not that we all know Estonian, but we have a research department translating all that we need to know. And so that is how we work. So in this Digital Rights Island case, we had to make an assessment of these competing values in the full knowledge and awareness of what the national supreme and constitutional judiciaries think about the matter. We also read standpoints of other stakeholders like the CCBE, for instance, on how you have to uh, balance and assess these competing values. In a world interconnected by technology, where one click may be enough for personal data to be transferred outside the UK, outside the EU, the fundamental right to privacy must also have an external dimension. I mean an external dimension between the Union and third state. And here, of course, the Schrems case comes to mind. You know, Schrems is a fantastic case. It's known in the jargon as the Facebook case. But I prefer to call it the Schrems case, and for a very simple reason. After the judgment, I met Mr. Schrems. Maximilian for the friends. This is a young man. I didn't ask his age, but I, I guess mid-twenties who is a law student writing doctoral arbeit in the Juridicum Wien. He is an Austrian law student. And he had taken up a Facebook account by ticking all the boxes, and you need to tick them, because if you don't tick one, you can't proceed further, and in the end, you can't have your, your account opened. I have no Facebook account, but I know this through our numerous daughters who have introduced me <laughs> um, as the matter of private knowledge of the judge. And this Mr. Schrems has ticked the box that Facebook Island, because all the Facebook activities in the European Union have their seat Facebook Island. And one of the boxes you tick is 
the authorization to transfer the data to Facebook International in the United States. But three, four years ago, a man called Edward Snowden reveals what the NSA, the National Security Agency in the United States, is authorized to do as a matter of US law vis-a-vis -vis such accounts. They have access, actually it's better said in German, Zugriff, which is slightly more aggressive as a word. Huh? Zugriff zu den Daten. <laughs> so access to these data, and not only to the metadata, like in digital rights, but to the actual content of the communications and everything. So Mr. Schrem said, I did not give a free and informed consent while ticking the box when I was 17 or whatever when he opened that account. So I withdraw my authorization and I now ask Facebook to stop transferring my data to the United States. Facebook said, we can't. You agreed and it's irrevocable or you close the account. Schrems went to the Irish data protection officer. And the data protection officer said, I have lots of sympathy with your case, but I can't do much for you because under the 95 EU directive, 1995 EU directive of, on the protection of personal data in the internal market, so it's free movement of personal data and protection of those data, there is a clause, Article 28, which says that if the Commission makes the assessment that a third state has an equivalent level of protection, an adequate level of protection, the word adequate is used in English, an adequate level of protection, and that is according to steady case law, a level of protection equivalent to that in the European Union. It must not be an identical way of protecting, procedurally and otherwise, but it must be of equal value. <coughs> the Commission, in May 2000, had adopted such a decision. May 2000, huh? that is about one and a half year before 9-11, and all the changes which have occurred since in US law in what they called the war on terrorism. And as we all know, this was not an innocent uh, naming of the combating of terrorism. When George W. Bush, then President of the United States, used that term, it was to sort of accredit with the larger public the idea that now the normal rules of the rule of law, democracy, state of law, did no longer apply. We were in war. And that's, of course, how also these laws, post-9-11 laws, came about and <clears throat> allowed for this wide access, substantively speaking, almost unlimited, and with no real remedies, judicial or otherwise, to make that impossible in the United States. So no remedies in the US. So this data protection offers in Ireland, by the way, the fact that that officer exists, there is an equivalent office in all of our member states now, because that directive provides for the obligation of member states to have such a privacy commission or data protection commission. It, the names differ in every member state, but it is an obligation of, of, the, of the directive. So he said, well, I can't do anything for you. There is this decision of the commission. It's binding. It's so far valid. I have to comply with it. I can't stop it. I'm bound as a national authority to the assessment of the commission. Mr. Schrem said, I'm not satisfied with that answer. And the data protection officer substantively sided with him. He said, I'm not satisfied either with my own answer, but I'm bound by union law go to court, which he did. So he went to the high court, Ireland, Dublin, and there the data protection officer said, I sympathize with the man, but we are stuck with that decision of the commission. And then, of course, happened what you would expect. The high court refers the matter to the court of justice. 
asks a few interpretation questions on that EU directive to, to learn about the exact criteria for assessing this equivalence, and beyond that, asks whether the decision is valid. And we say that the decision is invalid, so no longer a decision, and we gave the criteria for assessing the equivalence, after which the data protection officer entered in action, after our judgment, and ordered Facebook to stop transfer the data. And now there are negotiations between the EU and the United States to um, get into a new agreement. Um, but you see here as well, the authority of the Court of Justice is important because if there is one thing for which the United States also as a political uh, level of authority will set a step back and start thinking, it's when a court has ruled that their system is not fulfilling the standards, the constitutional standards of protection of fundamental rights, fair trial, and, and all the rest. That is for them very hard to take in. So once that is involved, they start really talking. As long as a court has not spoken, it's for them a matter of political bargaining and pure power game. Once a court has spoken in the name of the law, then they will start really talking. So far for the dynamics of combating terrorism and balancing rights, and you see how, again, in all these matters, lawyers play a crucial role. It's the lawyer of Schrems who took the matter to the High Court, brought it to our court, argued it in our court. It's always the dynamics of um, the lawyers acting for their clients, but at the same time furthering the system, the systemic value of the rule of law and the protection of fundamental rights. I give a second area example, and I will only use two, because I want also to have some room for questions on your side. And that is relating how else would you reflect it, or expect it, is relating to the um, refugee and asylum crisis, which we have, I say crisis, because we have unexpected numbers. The crisis is in fact existing in the countries where those people come from, rather than in the European Union. But the Union all the same, and its member states were not really prepared to take in such big numbers of people in need of international protection. And the member states act in their own ways, but there is also, as you know, quite a bit of European Union legislation. And that needs to be emphasized. Why is there European Union legislation? Not because the European Union is sort of a centralizing mastodont which wants to draw everything to its uh, field or sphere of activity. Simply because when you have a Schengen area called after the little, very little village where the agreement on an open space without internal frontiers was once concluded, when you have such an open space without internal frontiers, with common external borders, making each external border a matter of common interest, the border between Bulgaria and Turkey, where I was two months ago with a, a delegation of the Bulgarian um, government, Bar and courts, um, then you see that border is not just a matter of Bulgaria, that is a matter of common interest. So you have legislation defining the responsible member state for dealing with asylum requests, but you also have um, the so-called qualification directive, that is the um, <coughs> listing up of criteria which member states must comply with when they are granting or refusing asylum, this in order to avoid tendencies for asylum shopping, that one goes to a member state whose law is more favorable. And there are equally rules which determine once asylum has been granted, or also in the period when the asylum request is still pending, what are the minimum 
rules of the member states. Member states can do better, but not less well, uh, in terms of um, receiving these people and give them um, acceptable treatment. Now, one case came to us by the name of Allo and Osso. Those are two um, beneficiaries of what we call subsidiary protection. And for those of you who are not specialists of refugee law, I'm not claiming that I'm one, but I learned a lot through our case law, you must make a distinction between a refugee in the strict public international law sense, that is someone having received asylum under the Geneva Convention, and then the huge masses of people who are not individually prosecuted on the basis of their religion or their homosexuality or their race or another social feature which they have personally, but who simply flee, and that's bad enough, the indiscriminate violence of war, of starvation, of all sorts of um, inhuman and degrading circumstances. The European Union, and that is very positive, has organized next to the asylum status in the strict sense, the so-called subsidiary protection status. The subsidiary protection status is protecting those who have, as part of a larger group, something to flee for. Typically, the violence in Syria, in Iraq, those people are not refugees in the technical sense of the Geneva Convention. They are not individually prosecuted for one or another characteristic proper to them. But they are fleeing an impossible situation. So the European Union has enacted a special status for this mass influx of people in need of international protection, not of refugee status, and we call that the subsidiary protection, subsidiary to the formal refugee status under the Geneva Convention. So we got requests for preliminary rulings from national courts to know exactly what is the content of that subsidiary protection status. Can a member state, that was the Allo and Osso case, assign beneficiaries of that subsidiary protection to particular towns, cities, regions in a member state? This in order to spread them over the national territory with a view to spreading in a federal system like Germany the financial burden over all the Bundesländer and within the Bundesland over all the Gebietskörperschaften. And this not only for financial reasons of burden sharing, but also for reason of avoiding ghetto formation and enhancing possibilities of integration of the people in the local community through language training, access to the labor market. So all these societal questions, the question was, can this be done under the qualifications directive? We send it to our ground chamber and we decided that the answer to that question was yes, if the purpose is and it can be demonstrated that the member state is taking the measure to enhance social integration in the local fibers of society, not for financial reasons, because there we said money can always be sort of compensated, Finanzausgleich, as it's said in Germany, so we can always compensate. And so that is a very important, um, a very important uh, point. A last case, because I see that it may be late for some of you, but I want to, I want to mention also to pay tribute to the contribution of the bar. And those are the famous Geiselbash and Karim cases decided earlier this year, 2007, uh, 2016, 
also by the Grand Chamber of the Court. Those cases relate to the question of which member state is responsible for dealing with a request for asylum, or you now know what it is, for subsidiary protection. It's mostly and or. That is the famous Dublin regulation of which you certainly have heard. And roughly speaking, the primary responsible state is the state of first entry in the European Union. There are other criteria, but that's statistically the 90% plus criterion to designate a competent state. Now, the problem is that member states finding themselves in the front line, that is at the external border, with third states, they will have a disproportionate burden. And no one thought about the figures, the numbers of requests which we had since last year, 2015. So the system is under pressure. Our case law, as you know, protecting fundamental rights of the asylum seeker, has already in December 2011, in the famous NS case, said, in line with the Strasbourg case law, which is known under the name MSS case of January 2011 of the Human Rights Court, that a member state cannot avail itself of the Dublin regulation to send an asylum seeker or an applicant for subsidiary protection to a member state, although it is the competent slash responsible member state, when that member state is so flooded by numbers that an inhuman and degrading treatment of the asylum seeker will follow, totally contrary to Article 4 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights. That's a very important development. And we said the asylum seeker or the applicant for subsidiary protection can go to court in the member state where he actually finds himself or herself because they have in fact traveled through in the open area without internal frontiers to a particular member state and there they say, here I am, I want to request asylum here or subsidiary protection here and you have to care for me. And then that state will say, no, 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 the responsible state is Greece or Bulgaria or Italy, the sort of entry states. And then the asylum seeker or subsidiary protection applicant will say, no, 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 NS, when you send me back, I will be the object of inhuman and degrading treatment. So in the Geiselbach and Karim case law, we have um, fleshed out the procedural rights for the applicants to the point that they can have the courts verify the full list of criteria. Because, as I said, it's not only the member state of first entry. If, for instance, there is a, a minor, an unaccompanied minor, and there are many of them in this flow of refugees, and they ask protection, then it may well be that they cannot be sent back to the, first, the state of first entry, but that another member state is competent. So all these criteria need to be judicially reviewed. Now, in a previous text of the Dublin regulation, the legislator had said, this is only a matter of interest for the member states concerned. Who does what? For the asylum seeker or the applicant for subsidiary protection, that must be equal, which member states take care, state takes care of his um, or her requests. We say no. It really does make a difference in which member state you can stay pending the procedure and where you can possibly thereafter stay as a beneficiary of asylum or subsidiary protection. So we have characterized all these rules as rules containing droit subjectif, that is entitlements rights which can be enforced in the courts 
by the, um, um, by the national courts under this uh, directive. And that has been done uh, on, in compliance with appeals in that direction by the European Association of Administrative Courts and also by a number of bar associations. So it's a very, very important uh, aspect. I hope to have given you at least a flavor of what we are doing in these times. I took deliberately examples, and there are many more cases I could quote, but I'm not abusing of the time at this point in the day. Um, but the image which I want to transmit to you is the following. Yes, we are in the midst of the crisis about which you read in the newspapers, by way of speaking, or on the social media. We are en plein de l'actualité. However, we do so not sort of going with the waves, simply following what public opinion is expecting. The judge is not there to protect the majority. The majority can protect itself. They vote the laws. The judge is there to protect the minority. That is the one being kicked at. People who risk to be the object of discrimination. That's why the non-discrimination rules list a whole number of grounds, race, ethnic origin, gender, sexual orientation, age, handicap. The judge is there to protect the groups need, in need of protection, asylum seekers, subsidiary protection applicants, people wanting their privacy to be protected in spite of the fact that there is terrorism. But also, suspects of terrorism, suspects who have also rights to be protected because it's not, because you're suspected that there is any reality behind it. And I always illustrate that for my students in the following way. I once had to go through an absolutely benign medical checkup 10 years ago. Something innocent, like we all do. So this was in a big hospital in Belgium, and I gave my name, Koen Lennartz. And the man at the reception desk said, that's interesting. You're the third one today with that name. <laughs> and this is absolutely normal. Lennartz is in the Flemish part of this country, even in the Francophone part, because there have been many migrations, one of the most Ordinary names. It's like Janssens and Peters. The S is son of at the end. Huh? So it's in fact son of Leonard. Like Janssens is son of Jan and Peters is son of Peter. So Leonard is, is an absolutely common name. You find the page full in all the telephone bo books uh, of any city here in Belgium. And Kuhn in my generation was a popular name. There are so many of them. So the combination. All right. You got my picture. So judges need to be there to see that the ones targeted are the real ones. And for that, you need judicial scrutiny, facts, evidence, etc. People can't do it themselves. They need lawyers, sometimes also pro bono lawyers, to really do the work with them. It is at that price even in the heated circumstances like fight against terrorism, we are all appalled by what happened in Paris, in Brussels, in Munich. But we are equally appalled, I at least, if you have a feeling Big Brother is watching you or that marvelous movie about 10 years ago in Germany, Das Leben der Anderen. When you have seen that, then you know that the balance must be struck, struck. And in all these important matters, also the refugee examples, yes, we are flooded, but refugees are human beings. Courts and lawyers are allies in striking 
that balance correctly. And to do so in line with the fundamental values of European society, which differ often from American society. Think about the Schrems case. We need to have the courage of our own convictions and to bear them out. And that is a common venture of the bar and the bench. Certainly, that's the standpoint of the bench I'm presiding. And I hope we will for a long time work together in that direction. Thank you very much. Merci, Monsieur le Président, pour votre intervention. Vous avez terminé en évoquant le mot courage. Et c'est vrai que un philosophe, Vladimir Jankelevitch, disait que le courage est la vertu du commencement, c'est-à-dire la, la première des vertus. Sans courage, on ne peut rien faire. Moi, je vous propose que nous puissions continuer cette discussion et que chacun d'entre vous puisse poser des questions à la réception qui suit cette réunion. Ce sera beaucoup plus simple lors de cette réception que d'avoir un, un contact directement avec, euh, avec le président et lui poser des questions sur les points qu'il a abordés. Vous me répondrez d'ailleurs sur la question de la numérisation et des droits, parce que je considère qu'il y a un, un vrai risque quant aux droits, quant, quant à, la, à la numérisation. Nous en sommes Merci. Merci, monsieur le président. Merci, cher confrère. Merci, chers confrères, et je vous invite maintenant à la réception qui est organisée euh, juste à côté, je pense. Merci